Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry for my voice. I was exposed to one of the worst biological agents last weekend, a toddler, and my <laughs> immune system is not uh, as resistant to toddler germs as I would otherwise like, so hopefully it'll hold on for this hour. Otherwise, we'll make it an interpretive dance, or one of you can go on and present for me. So, what I wanted to do today is give kind of a wrap-up overview of what we've been doing for the last few weeks, and hopefully end upon at least giving you my opinion as to which of these are more uh, accurate for our view of the first 500 million years of Earth's history. So, we started uh, this series off with looking at uh, what the sort of the traditional view is and how it's been presented in popular culture. Uh, the traditional view, the hellish view, is that the early Earth was this molten uh, period where it was dry, where it was inhospitable, where <coughs> hellish, the Christian notion of hell, is really the best way to describe it. Uh, my sort of setup for this is that I take this view to be a myth, that this was something that came about in really the absence of any evidence, that this is a simple a story that seemed plausible that you could tell yourself, you know, the earth formed by bodies slamming into each other, we know it must have been hot early on, so we don't have rocks that old, so let's just keep the heat going and make it hot. Uh, but that the sort of, the more modern uh, view that is emerging and that I've talked about during this lecture series is that this is actually uh, something where there was a lot more water, where there was uh, possibly life, where the atmosphere was probably a lot closer to the modern atmosphere than we would have originally thought. And the goal is to try and over the last few weeks to tackle our origin myth by the use of modern technology and the geologic record to try and see what we can really learn and where I think the, the field is and where it's headed. So, uh, the, the other way to sort of phrase this is to look at Venus in comparison to Earth. Uh, Venus on the left here is a planet that is about the same size as Earth, it's in the same solar system, it's a little closer to the sun than we are, and yet it's this hellish inferno and the Earth is this uh, body that is covered mostly in water. It's got an atmosphere that we can live in. It's got life. The surface temperature here is, you know, 10 degrees Celsius. Here it's like 400 degrees Celsius. Here the rain is consistent with water. Here it's sulfuric acid. And so one of these is a lot more pleasant. And as we try and understand planets, and as we try and become sort of an extra and we are studying exoplanets and such, we really want to have an understanding of how planets work and how this difference came to be. So what do we need for habitability? These are the features that I've talked about. We need to be in, you want to be in the habitable zone, you want to be close enough to the host star that you get some energy, but you don't want to be too close that you burn up. Surface water is critically important for uh, life as we know it. We all like drinking water, so I don't I think I need to go on too much about the importance of it. Uh, one of the ideas of the origin of life is that it arose in the deep sea vents. It's great for chemical reactions and other such processes. Interior water is a key to things like plate tectonics. It's a thing, key to surface recycling. It is what allows rocks to bend. Dry rocks are incredibly uh, stable. They're incredibly rigid. But once you add even just a little bit of hydrogen, the bonds within those rocks get broken up because instead of having silicon oxygen, silicon oxygen, you might have silicon oxygen hydrogen gap. So that sort of breaks up the rock structure, and that is what allows them to bend much easier. And that's basically what the figure here is trying to convince you of. So having just a little bit of water makes all the difference in how your rocks behave and is one of the keys to plate tectonics. It also determines the melting behavior, so it is much easier to melt. If you do it at much lower temperatures when you have water than when the rock is dry, so things like mid-ocean ridges or volcanoes, things where the interior of the earth is melting and uh, exposing fresh materials to the surface and fresh uh, surfaces are important that they melt, so water is important there. 
uh, the composition, you obviously want to have the things that you're going to need for life. You're going to want to have the things that you need for your interior. The olive bean and the mantle is a huge part of the behavior, the rheology, how the stuff moves. But you also want things like carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, things you need for life. If you don't have those, then you've got a problem. Uh, planetary mass is hugely important for whether or not you keep your atmosphere. Tiny bodies are, there's not a lot of gravity, there's not a lot holding that atmosphere in, so it can escape to space, and then if we don't have an atmosphere, we can't have things like oxygen to breathe. The atmosphere also protects us from cosmic rays, from UV radiation, the ozone in the atmosphere. Uh, impacts are sort of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, they're great at delivering mass, they're great at delivering material. Carbonaceous chondrites, as we talked about, have weight percent carbon, weight percent water, so maybe they delivered some of that material that you need for life. On the other hand, impacts are to kill the dinosaurs, so if you have too many of them, you're going to wipe out the life as well. But maybe if you have just enough, you can heat your surface and make it uh, accessible to things like, hydro like extreme effects, like thermophiles that like warm temperatures. So we looked at some of these uh, in the preceding lecture about what the rates were, and I argued that they were probably on the lower end, so that they were probably an aid to early habitability rather than being high enough to, you know, boil off all the water. Satellites uh, are important for things like tides. They move stuff on the surface. They can also catch a little bit of impact. They can also serve as a great recorder of that early history. Uh, heating, if the planet were cold, there would be no plate tectonics, there would be no surface recycling. If there weren't this sort of heat loss, what is driving a lot of this is of plate tectonics is the fact that there's convection in the mantle so that there's a hot interior trying to get out. The fact that we have a molten outer core and a solid inner core is hugely important for the geodynamo, which also protects us. So the fact that the Earth is warm and hot is part of what makes it, in a sense, alive. It's part of what allows these dynamic processes to happen. Surface recycling is, of course, hugely important because it exposes fresh materials, fresh rocks, to the surface that can then, for example, the olivine can then react, uh, sorry, uh, can then react with, uh, uh, with things like uh, CO2 to form carbonate. So this is a huge, a great way, uh, this cycle is a great way to have things going on uh, that are chemicals. So you can pull CO2 out of the atmosphere over the long term by reacting it with basalt and forming carbonates. It can then get subducted into the mantle and then you can then refresh this and make fresh basalt so that you've got and the degassing also brings out, so you get a long-term carbon cycle going on, you get a long-term control on your atmosphere. And the geodynamo is, of course, important because it protects us from the solar wind, it protects us from radiation, it helps us, uh, it helps keep the radiation levels low on Earth so that we don't have to uh, worry about that so much. So this is this hugely complicated mess. If you were there for the first lecture, you sort of saw uh, this slide where all of these factors sort of feed back into themselves, your composition, mass, determine your heat flow, whether or not you're going to have plate tectonics, a dynamo, this determines your elemental cycling, and then this feeds into the planetary surface and ultimately feeds into habitability, your position also feeds in, into the, um, the decomposition. Uh, impacts, whether or not you can have liquid water, whether or not the surface temperature is high enough, your biochemistry, all of this falls in. My nice joke that this is at least simpler than running the war in Afghanistan. <laughs> so we've talked about a lot of these factors over the last few weeks. We've talked about the atmosphere, that the atmosphere is probably more similar to modern than we previously thought. The, we had active element cycling. I showed you this from the oxygen isotopes in the zircon, which we'll look at again. We had liquid water. We probably had plate tectonics back then. And we had a carbon inclusion with two carbon inclusions in the old zircon, so we at least have some of these elements. So it seems that after all of this time that we do have the things we need 
for a habitable early plant. So to go back to just the beginning, the way that planets form, when as the solar system is forming, there's a giant molecular cloud of dust and gas that at some point starts to accrete. The, gas, the dust starts to stick together. It forms things that are planetesimal. These are kilometer-sized, 10 or 100 kilometer-sized <coughs> objects. They collide into embryos. These are little sort of protoplanets. Mars is thought to be at the embryo stage. These are thousands of kilometers. And then these ultimately form into planets that then differentiate. By that I mean the iron in them goes to the core, and the silicate portion stays in the mantle. And the outer portion is probably molten in terms of a magma ocean, so that you have this molten rock on the surface of your uh, planet. So this process is ubiquitous. All of the planets that we see are differentiated. They are all uh, at this sort of outer magma ocean. Uh, depending upon your pressure and size, depends upon how deep your magma ocean is, how it crystallizes. So here's just a simple uh, model on the moon, where the first crust uh, formed by flotation. Up to 100 kilometer depth, you have 100% liquid. On Mars, it's a little harder. On Earth, it's even harder. For the same conditions, you only get 100% liquid, maybe to 30 kilometer depth. And this is because of the pressure increases as a function of depth. So then you have the solid material down uh, here. These models, uh, when you end up asking the chemistry what is crystallizing out of this, you end up with minerals like olivine, pyroxene. These are things you find in basalt. This is what you find in mid-ocean ridges. This is what you find in Hawaii. This is a mafic uh, early crust. This is not consistent with a granite or the continental crust as we know it. So this is very different. Uh, materials. However, uh, these, these models are, despite being enormously complicated, are still too simple because they, separate, they study the chemistry and the physical processes separately. So basically, the magma ocean is convecting, its material is moving, and yet these models simulate first the chemistry, and then they say, okay, the chemistry is done, we've crystallized it, let's see if this is stable, and they turn on the dynamics. And this, unfortunately, is simply not a good approximation to nature, so they make predictions that are maybe not entirely useful. So convection is something that really messes with this. As material moves, grains will either stay with the flow and not separate chemically, or if they reach a certain critical size, they can actually separate out from the flow. So the physical behavior will have an effect on the chemistry on the chemical evolution of your early sort of protoplanet. So, the simple model makes maybe crust. So here again we had uh, the chart that I gave you in a, in a handout. So here's the silica content. What we're sitting on today in the continental crust is over to the left between 60 and 70 weight percent silica. These are minerals like orthoclase, quartz, flage, muscovite, biotite, amphibole. Granite, granite diorite, dacite, rhyolite, either volcanic or if they crystallize below the surface, plutonic. But these models all predict that you would make something over here, pyroxene, olivine, a little bit of plagioclase. So if those models are correct, we're going to need some process to slowly build up and slowly move our way to the left on this diagram to build up the continental crust. But instead, what I want to do is actually go and look at the geologic record. So we've spent a lot of time in our lectures on that, which is what does the geologic record actually tell us? So here's a distribution of the preserved area of continental crust in uh, 10 million square kilometer increments going back from 0 to 4 billion years. There is two different models for what this should look like, but basically what you can see, most rocks are young, very few rocks are old, and in fact, no rocks are older than 4 billion years old. And this is because the planet is continuously destroying its crust. The combined actions of erosion, plate tectonics, uh, decimate the crust, and so it is very hard to go back to this old period, and this manifests itself in that people have a wide range of disagreement about how much continental crust there was back in the day. 
So this, uh, this plot here is now showing uh, time running in the reverse of the previous plot because we like people, we like messing with people, so we flip it, we switch it up. So we're going from zero to 100% present day continental crust, so this is the complement we have today. This here is, you know, 100 million years after planet formation, and you can see some models say nothing happened, to some models say, look, there, within, you know, 500 million years we had the complete continental crust, and in fact, five decided that we even had more than we have today, and then it's getting destroyed. So there's a huge span of disagreement, and whatever curve you want to take has really uh, already been taken. But let's go look and see when we have this sort of first appearance of continental crust on the planet. We went through this in one of the lectures where I showed you that we can look at zircons from New Wagata, Canada. This is up by, on the eastern shore of Hudson Bay in northern Canada, a place where you're quite likely to meet bears. Uh, it's quite desolate. And there are zircons there that are up to sort of 3.8 billion years old, but they remember an isotopic anomaly. They remember a differentiation event where the mantle was melted to form a crust. Uh, that goes back to 4.3 or 4.4 billion years. And this is the 142 neodymium isotopic difference from the mantle in parts per million. So this is, you know, 10 parts per million difference. And this comes to, this anomaly is from the decay of 146 seminary, which has a really short half-life and was only around in the early Earth. And the claim is that at 4.3 billion years, a mafic crust, a salt separated and gave us the rocks that we pick up later. Well, and then these rocks here look, were continuously processed to give us continental crust. So it gives us this nice mechanism of slow growth. But the thing is, when we go and look at this, I showed you that the Sumerian-Indian ratio between mafic and felsic rocks is not actually all that different. So you can't really make this claim that this was a mafic precursor. And we instead look at the rubidium strontium system as preserved in apatites that are included in these old zircons. Apatite is a calcium phosphate. And if this mafic distribution is correct, we would expect the data to array about this blue line here, which is similar to the mantle. So we would expect this isotopic ratio to be like 0.7. Instead, we find anything else. We generally find higher values. And these require very high rubidium strontium ratios, and the rubidium strontium ratio is heavily correlated with the silica content. So a high rubidium strontium ratio occurs in rocks that have a high silica content, and therefore we need really early continental crust, like 65, 70 weight percent silica, to explain these results. Uh, very briefly, just as an aside, if you try and make this from a basalt that has been weathered, this really doesn't work uh, because you don't have a source of rubidium. Rubidium comes from the continental crust. If you don't have a continental crust, you can't actually do this. So when we looked at the Lutetium hafni in the Sumerian-Indian system, the data are consistent with either a mafic source, here is silica, versus rocks that meet the criteria that's been determined geochemically for these rocks, or either mafic or felsic, but they can't decide uniquely. When we added strontium to the story, we found that it was a very high silica early crust, and that this suggests that the Earth formed a continental crust within, you know, 150 million years of its existence, so very, very early on, and that you don't need this sort of slow growth. So then, uh, we switch gears a little bit into a mineral called zircon, which is our most direct uh, record of that time period. So this is the uh, zircon is great slide to demonstrate why this is my favorite mineral. Uh, it takes a variety of very useful elements. We looked at the rare earth elements. We looked at cerium to talk about the atmosphere composition. Uh, Apneum isotopes are useful for tracing the silica content. Oxygen up here will tell us about the, whether or not there's weathering on the surface. And titanium here has been used to tell us at what temperature the zircon crystallized. Yeah. Zircon crystallizing at high temperatures takes more titanium than one crystallizing at low temperatures. So, what do these 
samples tell us these zircons are found in the Jack Hills in Western Australia. Uh, here's a picture of the outcrop. So very briefly what they tell us, there's a picture, by the way, uh, this is the scale wire. This is about maybe 200 microns, so 0.2 millimeters. <coughs> here's a picture with a pen for scale. So the first thing that they tell us is that the temperatures at which they crystallize, 680 degrees C, is about as low as you can melt a rock, and that this requires an enormous amount of water. This requires that the source was water saturated, so it requires that we actually have an external source of water to the magma. So we need to bury sediment and melt, and actually have the water from that go up into our melt, so that we can actually get water saturated. The inclusion assemblage, if we look at the inclusions in these zircons, they look like muscovite, feldspar, quartz. They very much so look like granitic inclusions. They do not look like, say, pyroxene or something that you would expect from a basalt. <coughs> the, the geotherm, the heat flow, you can calculate this from knowing the crystallization temperature and the guess at the depth, is actually really low. We'll get back to that in a second. The hafnium isotopes, which are used, the lutetium hafnium ratio changes as you uh, differentiate, so as you melt the mantle to form a crust, you will get change in lutetium hafnium ratios. And there's a huge diversity, but they all point to events that are very early, 4.4, 4.5 billion years ago, and that there was perhaps a variety of chemical compositions. They trace element signatures here plotted as uranium over deuterium versus yttrium, show that they look like continental zircons rather than oceanic crust zircons. So they did not form in a setting like a mid-ocean ridge or Iceland or something like that. They actually look like the continental crust. So what is the best explanation? If we put all of this together, it suggests that there was a subduction zone uh, very early on, that there was a plate that was going under. This dragged down sediments that then melted and added water. And then this is where you get the water saturated melting. And this also explains the low heat flows because you're dragging a cold plate into the hot mantle and locally sort of cooling it, and therefore producing much lower uh, heat flows. So this suggests that, in fact, the early Earth had a tectonic environment that was much more similar to today than we previously thought. So the graphic at the top left here shows us the sort of modern day plate tectonic regime where you've got subduction zones that melt and form island marks so they can melt under a continent and uh, form volcanoes. This is like you know the Andes coming up in South America. There's the mid-ocean ridges where the oceanic crust is getting pulled apart, where you've got things like black smokers that are thought to be really good for the origin of life. So the picture that these Hadean zircons tell us by requiring, by showing that they came up in a subduction zone is that maybe the best way to explain this is to invoke a very sort of modern regime for the planet because this is how the planet operates today, so that we get this amazing sort of cycling of material from the depth <laughs> uh, to the surface, and that we can <coughs> uh, sort of move this stuff around, and that, therefore, we can create environments and have environments that very much so look like where we think we might have the origin of life. So then, uh, we looked at the question of whether or not there was life back then, and whether or not there's any evidence for biologic activities. And this is a study that has been sort of complicated by the fact that people, uh, Menik and Adele in 2007, claimed that they found diamonds here and here, and there there's a subsurface diamond. But basically, the issue is that they found diamonds in every single zircon that they looked at, and they chose to polish their samples with diamond. So uh, it seemed pretty suspicious. And actually, Do uh, Larissa Dobrynitskaya, in 2014, published a study where she asked for their samples, cut them out. And what you can see here is that if you look at this in the diamond in the cross section, there is zircon, but that's not actually in contact with the diamond. Actually, this was a K-feldspar inclusion that they had polished out. 
which is much softer, which is sort of here, and then the diamond uh, was put in there from the polishing compound along with epoxy. So this is basically contamination. And ultimately left us with the question, well, what is the, can we even find carbon here? How much carbon is there? And if so, what does the isotopic signature of that carbon uh, actually uh, tell us? So we went and undertook a search using uh, Raman spectroscopy. So we went and found, optically looked at the zircons and found black inclusions. So graphite's going to be a little black dot inside the zircon. And then for the Raman spectroscopy, we aimed the laser at it and then looked at the response, looked at the light that was scattered off to see what it looks like because graphite has got a really characteristic spectrum. And in one 4.1 billion year old zircon, we got incredibly lucky. There's actually two carbon inclusions. <coughs> And uh, if you look, here is our Raman shift in red. This is epoxy. So the first thing we wanted to be sure of was that we weren't uh, looking at contamination ourselves. These zircons have been mounted in epoxy. So you can see here there is a really prominent feature in uh, the epoxy. This is the CH stretch, carbon hydrogen bond, uh, has this feature in the Raman. And you can see it's not there in the black, which is the, symbol, the signature from our inclusion. But our inclusion does have these nice uh, graphite bands, although they're a little broader, probably from radiation damage. So, doesn't look like epoxy, looks like graphite, so that's good. So that way we can uh, go ahead and do this. We've since then found a couple of other zircons that have graphite inclusions. So here is a really big graphite inclusion in a younger zircon. We have not found a single diamond. This is good. It would be really weird to find diamonds in this setting. Diamonds form at high pressure, sort of deep in the mantle. These zircons formed in the crust. It's really hard to explain how you get diamond in there, so that finding never actually made much sense. We're finding five carbonaceous inclusions out of 130 zircons that we've investigated. So we basically have a 95% failure rate in this search. So when we look at things that we think are promising, we're only finding it less than 5% of the time. So these are extremely rare inclusions. And this is going to be uh, something to keep in mind going forward, is that to even have 130 zircons to investigate, you need to date, well, you need to date about 3,000 zircons. So this is basically a part per thousand sort of finding. So for one zircon with a graphite inclusion, there's 999 zircons that don't have a carbon inclusion. And that's part of what makes this study so difficult. Uh, so all of these ones that we found are fully enclosed. Uh, one is on a crack, but uh, so we're going to ignore that. So we've got four fully enclosed ones. Here's a picture of another one. This one you can see is on a crack. Here's the graphite sitting on a crack. So let's go back to our favorite example, our 4.1 billion year old uh, zircon, to really convince ourselves that this was a clean, simple zircon. Uh, we went and did an nano CT scan. So here's a picture. There's a carbon inclusion. There's the other carbon inclusion. And they look empty because anything that doesn't absorb x rays is going to look light. Carbon doesn't absorb x-rays as much as the zircon does, so the zircon here looks dark. The sort of air around it is really white. This is a needle that it was a metallic needle that it was attached to, so you can see that really absorbs x-rays. So then we made this little buoy. Now we've inverted it. Now you're white if you absorb x-rays, so you're going to see the two carbon inclusions here in the dark. This was done up at Stanford. Uh, so there you can see it coming around. There are our two inclusions. And you can see that there are absolutely no cracks anywhere to be seen. And this has a spatial resolution of like 40 nanometers. So even cracks that are incredibly small that you couldn't see with the naked eye, we weren't able to uh, find. So there's no evidence for this. So then we started on the ion probe and got the isotopic signature. 
So if you'll remember back, yes? Zircons are always like 100, mil 100 microns? Uh, zircons can be tiny. So there are zircons that are less than 10 microns. And then there are gem quality huge zircons that are like centimeters. So if you go to the Field Museum, they've got some beautiful zircon specimens that are a variety of sizes. For us, most zircons, however, the most common sizes is probably 200 microns in the long direction. And the really ancient ones, 4 billion years or more, are going to be 100 microns, 200 microns? Yeah, and a little bit on the smaller side too, because uh, as they get worn and rounded and such, material is likely to be removed, right? If you're getting transported, uh, you're likely to lose a little bit of material. That's why a lot of them look rounded. They don't crystallize that way. They actually are sort of elongated. They're almost cylindrical when they crystallize. They're eroded, sort of. Yes. Stone in the creek bed or something. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a perfect time for me to introduce. What does Zircons tell us about one main thing, heat? What was the temperature of the oceans? I don't mean the exact temperature, but were the oceans hot? Were they warm? Were they very hot? Was the, because four and a half billion years ago, all the radioactive materials were really hot. <laughs> So the earth was hot, the mantle was hot. So what can we derive from temperatures of all of this, from, if anything, from Zircon? The temperature of the early oceans is a question that is open to debate and the range of the literature. So in the Indian, we have absolutely no idea. We know that there was liquid water, but you can stabilize liquid water you know, between zero and above 100 C, right? Depending on what you do with the atmosphere and your pressure cooker, you can stabilize liquid water at very high temperatures. So, we don't know. Because the, we don't have any information, we don't have a recorder, we don't have a good thermometer that tells us that temperature. Um, going into the Archean, where we have a record of sediments, where since if, you, if something is forming by precipitating from the ocean, like say carbonate, you can analyze its oxygen isotope composition and the effect how much the oxygen isotopes differ from the water tells you the temperature. Unfortunately, old samples also experienced a lot of metamorphism that tends to uh, sort of reset them to higher temperature. So if they saw hydro, your carbonate sees a hydrothermal fluid, or your silica sees a hydro, hydrothermal fluid, you've got a problem. So the range of temperatures are anywhere from really cold because the arguments are that you know the, the, the sun wasn't outputting as much energy, so the early oceans are thought to be cold. The geologic record instead suggests that they were quite hot from oxygen isotopes, like 70 or 80 C. The problem is, it's hard to say if those samples precipitated from an ocean or from a hydrothermal fluid. So this is an, this is an active area of investigation. And so, uh, there's evidence, there's even evidence that the average temperature was 20 or 30 degrees C in the Archean for the ocean. So, but we know that there was an ocean, we just don't quite know the temperature yet. Uh, and the range of possibility really is everything from 0 to 100 degrees or even above that depending on how we, what you want your atmosphere to do. Uh, so the carbon isotopes suggest that uh, there may have been life back then, that they are consistent with, or, with uh, biogenic materials. This is, we can do this because life is cheap. It prefers carbon-12 over carbon-13. So if you find an excess of carbon-12 in your sample over carbon-13, that's what the scale is expressing here. This is basically the deficit in 13 carbon. This is 2.5% depleted relative to our standard. So this is non-biogenic material here. This is biogenic material like carrageen in the organic field here. And then here are some old samples. Now here are ones at about 3.8, and then are ones plotting right in the middle of this field at 4.1 billion years. So this is suggesting that the early planet may have even had uh, life on it. This is not a smoking gun, there's other explanations for this, but that certainly is the simplest explanation. So now I wanted to get to, 
get to the handout that I gave you and the sort of the timeline that I wanted to sort of put everything together into what I think are the timings of when some of these things happened. So at the very top, the solar system formed sort of four and a half billion years ago, 4.567 billion years ago, really easy to remember. Uh, the moon formed at about 4.51 billion years ago when a large object ran into the Earth and blew off something into space by basically 4.38, almost 4.4 billion years ago, we had the first evidence for a high silica crust. Rhyolite is just a volcanic rock that has a really high silica content. So within you know, 150 million, 200 million years of the planet forming, we have evidence for continental crust that we have this sort of high silica um, uh, event by the time we get to uh, 80 million years later, so 4.3, we have evidence for liquid water uh, at the surface of the Earth from the oxygen isotopes, and then we have a at 4.2 million years, the oldest inclusions that suggest sort of a plate tectonic, so maybe this is the sort of the origin of plate tectonic. And then by 4.1 million years, we have the evidence uh, for life. So that this is really in contrast to this hellish picture, which would move all of these things way more to the present, because it would say things like, no, you can't have liquid water uh, back then. So now, so there is what is, in my view, sort of the best uh, evidence for when, or the, the best estimates of the timing for when these things first appeared on Earth, at least as far as our evidence today is concerned. This may change in the future. As we develop, we've only so far looked at carbon from a single zircon, so maybe this will get pushed up. But I don't think these are going to get younger. So these are basically lower limits on when this process uh, started. So now, the sort of open questions as to where I think this field is headed or should be headed are how representative is this view? I've given you proof, evidence that this existed at a certain time, at a certain place, well, the place just being the Earth, we don't quite know where on the Earth, but that we don't know how representative this was. The continental crust of New Wagatan, was that the present volume of the continental crust, or was that, you know, a water bottle sized chunk of rock and we're lucky enough to have evidence of it today? Was this a global process? Was this local? Did plate tectonics start and stop? Or did it simply start up once and then this was the regime and it took over and it uh, dominated the planet? The Hadean zircons and the Jack Hills give us evidence for plate tectonics for underthrusting. <coughs> but is this a local event? Did this happen once and then it, it failed to, and then it started up at a later time? Or was this a sort of pervasive process? When, it's, when did life itself actually originate? We can give you lower limits on it. 4.1 billion years is, I think, a good lower limit based upon when we have the earliest evidence for life. But we don't quite know actually when this happened. We're always sort of chasing behind because we're looking for evidence that life left on the rock record. And so we can't really tell you yet when it originated. And that goes right along with the next question, which is, in what environment did life originate? In order to address this question, we need to sort of answer the one above it and maybe the, the impact one below it first. So we need to know how much continental crust there was. What did it look like? Were there, uh, how pervasive were oceans? Was there only a little bit of surface water or was there a lot of surface water? So that we have at least some idea of what the environments are that happened on this early Earth, so that we can at least try and understand what are reasonable guesses at uh, the places where life might have originated. We discussed the Miller-Urey experiment, where they put a very reducing atmosphere in a bulb, uh, put a spark to it, and said, look, we can make amino acids, and the problem there is, this is a great experiment, uh, revolutionized biochemistry, and revolutionized our looking into the early Earth. Unfortunately, uh, into the origins of life. Unfortunately, that atmospheric composition doesn't actually make any sense for what we know about the early Earth, because instead of methane, we probably had carbon dioxide. So in order to do these experiments and look at the environments 
where life might originate and what the mechanisms are, I think it's on us as the geochemists, as the geologists, to at least try and narrow down what the environment is of the only successful case we know of life arising on a planet being this one. Um, where impacts an important process, and to what extent we looked at the range of effects that impacts can have. On the one hand, they can boil up all the water that you have on your planet. On the other hand, they can deliver healthful materials. They can kill the dinosaurs. They can produce temperatures that extremophiles like. So I think we need a lot more work in that point, which is what were the impact rates? Were they important? What were they doing? Uh, and uh, what uh, so what happened? And then finally, sort of, did the Earth have a magnetic field? The magnetic field is vitally important to protecting us from radiation. It is vitally important to keeping our atmosphere. It's much easier to strip an atmosphere off. You don't have one. It is also a huge constraint on the thermal history of the planet in terms of. Uh, we actually, if there wasn't working dynamo, then it needs to be in a thermal regime where that was possible. If there wasn't, it probably tells us that it was too hot for that. So this is one of the most exciting uh, areas at the bottom is trying to use zircons, and particularly the inclusions in the zircons as recorders of the magnetic field back in the day. So if a zircon includes something that's a little bit metallic, then the metal, like your sort of your bar magnets, can remember the magnetization when they formed as they cooled through the Curie temperature. And, hope, and maybe they can preserve that record to present day so that you can analyze it in the lab and say the Earth did or did not have a magnetic field. We talked a little bit about this. There is one study claiming that the Earth did have a magnetic field. Unfortunately, that study was contaminated by mineral inclusions that formed after the zircon formed, that formed much later. So it's, it's more likely that they recorded a recent field. So we don't actually have a good way of doing this quite yet. Simply finding an old zircon and saying, hey look, you've got an iron oxide in it, you can record a magnetic field, isn't good because we know the iron oxide formed later. They're coating the surface of the grains, they're coating the cracks. So these are secondary processes, so we need to be able to disentangle that later paleomagnetic information from a more recent field when the secondary minerals formed, you know, a billion, two billion years ago, to what that original answer really was. So what do we need to answer these questions? Well, we need a whole lot more zircons. I've already said in 130 zircons we examined by Raman, we found five that have carbon inclusions. There's about a 3% success rate at the best site in Western Australia. So 3% of the zircons you analyze are 4 billion years or older. And then 5% of those will have a carbon inclusion in them. So we're looking at something like, you know, part per 30, part per, let's just say it's a part per thousand sort of probability that we'll have a use, that we'll have a carbon inclusion in the zircon. And now, if we look at some of these other sites here, every star here is a site where a one or more Hadean zircon has been found. In some of these cases, people analyzed hundreds or maybe a thousand zircons. And so if they're finding hit rates on the order of a part per thousand, you're going to need to date millions of zircons in order to actually try and answer this question. And the nice part is we now have the technology to do that. So what I think we actually need to answer this question is simply a concerted effort to develop some of these sites and get more than one zircon from them, or go and sample other parts on the planet and discover Zircon, and that in order to uh, the simple statistical calculation here, basically to achieve 90% confidence in detecting a Hadean zircon uh, from a population in which 1 in 2,000 are Hadean requires you to date 5,000 grains. So basically, there's sort of 10 sites that we need to still look at. So one place to start would be to simply date 50,000 zircons, which would be 5,000 per site, and at least get a handle on what the population's sort of look like. But if we then want to build this up, right, if we don't just want to find a single grain, but we want to find a thousand, we're going to have to multiply this by a huge number, and you're looking at dating millions of zircon, you're looking at an endeavor 
that is on the same cost as sort of a space, a small space mission. So uh, informally, this has uh, been you know, you know, the project, the mission to the early Earth. Uh, but this would be something that would be incredibly cool to do, and I think uh, would answer a lot of our questions. Is in terms of representativeness, is to develop these sites out, going to other places, China, Brazil, and looking at what the old zircons there look like, simply because, and this is hard because the sites aren't as ideal. So, in conclusion to this lecture series, before I take your questions, hell is your Hadean. I think it's Hadean, it's the Greek vision of hell. It's, it's wet and cold rather than uh, warm and dry. Thank you. C13 is basically a part in 100. Part in 100? Yeah, so out of 100 carbon atoms, well, one that's is That's very carbon. high. I didn't realize it was that high. Yep. Okay. Um, with respect to life existing in extremely hot conditions, we already know from places like Yellowstone and others that archaea can exist at extremely high temperatures. So that's not a, a, a disclaimer or, or a disqualifier. Uh, but no, my thing is actually if life did originate in those environments, impact would be a helpful process. Right. They would deliver heat and produce it. So the other part of the problem which you're, you're, you're fishing at or fishing for is the problem of, of having a magnetic field of one sort or another. Um, if many of these things actually arose within an oceanic environment, the water itself would protect from uh, extraneous radiation, right? Uh, water itself is a great protector, yes. So that is one uh, caveat, but you're still talking at this, so you're still, the effects on life would be less in terms of if it's happening in the ocean, but the effects on the atmosphere in terms of stripping the atmosphere could still conceivably be quite high. Yeah, but, but you know, with respect to the atmosphere, the real problem there is the migration of life from, from oceanic environments out of into terrestrial environments. And that didn't occur until quite a bit later. The, well, the issue is you're making, the question is where did life originate? If it originated in the ocean, then the atmosphere problem and the geodynamo get considerably simpler. There's other ideas that it originated in hydrothermal fields on a continental setting. So, since uh, we don't know, we, right, the, well, the plausible things that go into habitability are important factors. You can, you can play with making some of them more or less important, depending on where you might want to do it. But we don't know where life arose. So, okay. Uh, we don't know <clears throat> if the first oceans were salt water or fresh water. Is that correct? Uh, the oceanic composition is hard to nail down through time. It is likely that uh, there was always a lot of salt in it. So minerals like plagio, uh, salt is, so sodium is pretty abundant in rocks, especially the more mafic ones. So if you weather those and erode them into the ocean, it's likely that you will have uh, a salty ocean. And so it takes millions of years. Yeah, but millions of years is sort of quick on our time scale, right? We're talking billions here. So okay, that, that water, if it did come um, Comets or meteorites, I mean, they come in pretty, they come pretty fast. Uh, so the more, I mean, things like uh, potassium in the ocean is probably a more recent uh, thing, but probably sodium contents in the ocean, I would guess, uh, would be would have always been quite high. Yeah. To back up a bit, you said we need you study one to two thousand zircons in order to find one that is in the range of four billion years old or more, right? Uh, yeah, somewhere in that order. And then from that, you are only going to find three out of <coughs> uh, five out of a hundred that have carbon. Carbon, like but yeah. you use that mostly to determine the or the date of the origin of life. Yes, and what the carbon is, right. if there was carbon available on the early Earth and things like that. But then, for all, all sorts of other things we want to learn, we'll use the other old zircons. Yes, and they have they have other useful uh, potential. 
So the other old zircons will, can be, will be useful for things like temperatures and oxygen isotopes and such. So yes, but some of the hard questions like the origin of life really require us to get a feed. And we need the metallic or iron ferrous elements to tell us something about the magnetic field. Because that seems to be really important too, exactly when the magnetic field first formed. And, and that is probably the hardest out of these questions to answer, simply because iron oxide thrust is a great secondary contaminant in zircon. Oh. So that makes this a much, much more difficult problem. So there's, it's still, I'm a co-author on a paper that was recently submitted, even trying to clean the zircons in acid is not actually effective enough. The magnetometers are so sensitive nowadays that even once you clean and torture your zircons, it's not enough to yet remove all of the contamination. It makes it a lot better, but doesn't actually solve your problem yet. Do we have an absolute date when we know that, the, or the earliest possible date that we know that the magnetic field formed? Uh, there's, our, there's an estimate for our key in ages sort of around, I want to say, three and a half billion years old. But it could have been much earlier than that. Yes, we just don't have a record of it. Right. And so that's the question. We, don't, we can't say yes or no to that question. We, we imagine that life could not have formed without a magnetic field, though, right? Uh, that, it, that depends in part upon where, where life formed if it was protected from radiation. Uh, my, it, it is a huge part of habitability today. So my thinking would be it would make it a lot easier early on if it formed out of a formed black smoker way down inside in the atmosphere. It was relevant in hydrothermal pools close to the surface. Then it the would have to be shielded from cosmic rays. Then the magnetic field would be hugely important. If it formed in the depth of the ocean on a black, on a black smoker, maybe they're less important. But the effects on the atmosphere, you're still going to uh, rapidly strip off your atmosphere if you don't have a magnetic field. So that is also <coughs> The water in their surface. Uh, so you might evaporate, uh, you might lose water that way quite efficiently. So um, there's a number of reasons why a magnetic field is important um, directly for retaining an atmosphere. It's very important. You seem to be talking about some younger material being in the middle of an older zircon. Yes. So how can it get in there? Uh, if you have a crack, like if you have an inclusion and you have it surrounded by the zircon. As the zircon is heated, the inclusion is going to expand at a different temperature, uh, at a different rate than the zircon, and that'll sort of stress the material and crack it. If you've ever opened a tough jar by running it under hot water, the jar lid expands faster than the jar, and so if you put it under hot water, you can get it open. Well, if that happens, you're forming a little void space in a crack. So some later time, the zircon is sitting there, fluid comes through, well, groundwater. Uh, it will affect the camera, it will deposit some material. So it's a two-part process of first making a crack and then infiltration and chemical alteration later. So those cracks, they uh, can later completely close so they are not detectable? <coughs> uh, I don't think they can ever completely close, but they can mineralize so we can see the iron in them. But they don't, like, they don't go back to being pristine zircon, basically. <laughs> Uh, I think that is probably one of the best uh, indicators of life that we have. O2 is an incredibly reactive molecule. It is a really short uh, time that it's around in the atmosphere. You need an active source to produce it, and the easiest way that I can think of producing it would be life. So I'm sure, on the other hand, though, if you put a bunch of uh, people in a room and tell them to figure out how to make O2 without invoking life, give me a bunch of geochemists. I'm sure somebody will figure it out, too. It'll just be a very convoluted mechanism. So, uh, I don't think anything will ever be definitive until they bring a little green man to Earth and yeah. we can throw it, but... We already have him. Except he's orange. And I think there's a lunch for... Yeah. Yeah. So, 